Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. A Town Built on Salt by Wendy Lynn Harris Liam stood next to the most warped section of his fence and towed the soft, wet ground below it. A boy in his sixth-grade class had told him a story about a sinkhole that had opened up on his property last week. It was big enough for their dog to fall into, the boy had said. The ground had suddenly opened its mouth, small at first, then as big as a dinner plate. The earth had poured into the center of that hole, like sand in an hourglass, five feet deep. The whole town was going under. Liam had watched a news broadcast with his mother the night before, confirming it. Channel 5 played a cell phone video shot by a teenager who'd meant to be filming his best friend's skateboard trick. On the screen, Liam had watched a parked car fall clean out of view. One second there, the next, gone. The earth had gulped it down whole. It was the salt mining, the newscaster had said. That and the heavy rains. Liam hadn't told his father that their fence had changed. The man would have seen the damage for himself if he'd made his Sunday visit on time, but darkness had covered the yard by the time his father had arrived, and Liam hadn't even gotten to see him. His father had said something drunk and slurry as his mother had opened the door, and she'd slammed it shut right after, locking his father out. The next morning, Liam's mother scrubbed a boot print off the front door, but pretended Liam's father had never showed up. The mines were nearly empty now, and people like Liam's father had been out of work for over a year. Everyone in Liam's class had been told there would be government assistance when it came time for them to graduate high school since the town's biggest industry was dead. Liam walked back a few steps, until he stood in the center of his small yard. He watched his white pickets for any sign of movement south. If something budged even a little, he would run to the house and call his mother at her job. She would tell him to stay inside where it was safe, Then she would find his father, and they would rush home together. They would fix the yard, and his father would move back home for protection. It could happen at any moment, the newscaster had said. Liam already knew three other people with sinkholes. One was the boy in his class. Another was the school nurse who was taking it bad. Nurse Gravel had wrung her hands at the school assembly last Friday, pacing back and forth near the bleachers. They'd been gathered to honor the retiring art teacher— but Nurse Gravel had interrupted right as the school principal was about to give out the plaque. "'We need to save the children,' she'd cried, walking in front of the ceremony. Nurse Gravel had swiped the microphone from the principal's hand and implored the students to listen. "'There are warning signs,' she'd said. "'The birds have all left our town. Haven't you noticed? We need to pray, every one of us.' The principal had pulled the microphone away from her and ushered Nurse Gravel toward the double doors that led to the parking lot. Nurse Gravel had scammed the crowd as she left— and she'd spotted Liam. He'd held her eye until the doors shut her out. The other sinkhole person Liam knew was Miss Judy, his mother's best friend. He didn't get to hear Miss Judy's story firsthand, only his mother's account and opinion about it all. Liam had not been allowed to go see the gaping hole that had sunk Miss Judy's entire set of patio furniture. It had been sudden, Liam's mother told him, like an elevator with a broken cable. Snap. Poof. Gone. Liam's mother and Miss Judy were not alarmed. Miss Judy had wanted new patio furniture for years. Liam searched above for birds, but only saw clouds inching toward each other in the darkening sky. The air felt wet and hushed. He returned his attention to the fence and tried to limit his blinks. He stepped forward, watching for subtle movements. Suddenly, a long stick of lightning cracked to the sky above him. Everything went silent for the count of four. Liam stood still and waited for his fence to slip lower, but the pickets didn't budge. When thunder hit, he felt it rumble across the whole town, all the way to the ground beneath his feet. It shook his teeth. He heard a snap of wood behind him and turned to watch the spectacle. When an entire house is eaten by a sinkhole, he would later tell his mother, it does not pour itself to the bottom of the earth like sand or lose its footing quickly in one loud drop. Instead, it crumbles at the edges, from one corner to the next, 
then slowly melts away. Hanako Learns to Count by Sean Patrick Whiteley You can't will yourself to die. You just can't. I've been trying, believe me. Sixty years now I've been holding my breath. But you just can't die like that. One foot in front of the next, in front of the next, and in front of the next, until I reach the wall. And then turn, and one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, and in front of the other, until I reach the opposite wall. And I can't will myself to die. At night, the moon shines down. She asks me, Have you been practicing your numbers, Hanako? I nod, but she looks like she doesn't believe me. So I count the stones in the walls. One, two, three, uh, three, uh, one, two, three, uh, four, one, two, uh... Uh, three, four, five, uh, uh, and so on. Still learning. In the morning, I stare at the two-leg, short-nosed elephants staring at me. That's what I do when they stare. I stare. What are you looking at, eh? I don't do anything. Not really, so you're not going to see much. What does it do in there all day? A little two-leg short nose asks an elder two-leg short nose. The elder says, Don't know. Nothing, I guess. Nothing. I'd go crazy. Yeah, I think. The elder smiles, but there isn't much joy behind her lips. I'd just will myself to die. Exactly, I think, and a loud bellow comes from my nose. Don't you think I've tried? When they leave, I am alone, again. So I sway to and fro, my nose brushing along the hard ground. I make up games, but they grow dull quickly, and I must make up new games, like count the lines on my feet. One, two, three, four, uh, four. One, two, uh, two, three, uh, uh, uh. I have lots of lines. Sway my nose, brush it on the ground, walk to the wall, turn, walk to the wall, turn. Walk to the wall, turn. I like the sun. I like it best when it leaves, watching it go. The sky is all I have. After all of the two-legged short noses are gone, the sun falls to the ground and it explodes, changing the sky. That's where I'll go. When I die, I want to be part of that explosion. The moon comes back for me. I fall down, not to sleep this night. Nothing goes into me, nothing comes out. The moon stays with me while it hurts, and when it doesn't hurt any more, when I leave, the moon leaves with me, taking me into her sky. Count the stars, Hanako, says the moon, and when she speaks, it's light that pours from her mouth. I look about, and there are so many stars. Count all of these? The moon glows. Count them, Hanako. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. The stories on today's episode crack the world open in all sorts of literal and figurative ways. We started with a town built on salt, which confuses and muddles together what is a safe space and what is not. This theme of space and place just keeps finding us. It's been a through line all the way through 2017. It's been interesting. When I put this episode together, space and place was not on my mind. But as I think about it now, you know, you go from... This story where a person is not sure what's the safe space and what's not to Hanako, whose space is more than safe and who would like nothing more in the world than to get out of it. 
And then we have the writing spaces segment, which we're going to go into next. Usually these come in pairs. Today we just have one. Jeffrey Tony is a friend of the show, a contributor to the Drabble episode, as well as a previous episode. Always um, someone who has been a great supporter of the show. When I called writers to talk about their writing spaces, I really wanted them to work independently of the photo. I told the writers, you know, have the audio work by itself because this is an audio medium. And then if the people want to see the photo, that's great. They can click on it and take a look. But Jeffrey's photo, if you go look at it, the link is in the show notes. It really is of chaos. And I love that his words are also chaotic and yet bring an order over the course of his essay. So that might be one that might be worth doing photo and audio combined. And then we're going to wrap up with Lisa Ko with the story Watermelon, where the world cracks open in an entirely different sort of way. It's just been so interesting. Writing Spaces is a segment that's winding down for 2017. I only have one segment left. I'm going to put it up the first episode in September. And it has been kind of the anchor as we've had this theme of place on this show. And I have really enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm currently mulling over Writing Spaces' future. In the past, it's been open to previous contributors to the show, wondering if we should keep that up or broaden it somehow, change the prompt a little bit or keep it the same. I would love to hear from you, the listeners, if you like the segment and if there's anything you would suggest as we think about its future, because it is winding down for 2017 as we bring you other things. While I am on the talk about announcements, before I get to that writing spaces and watermelon, really quickly, our friends at the 10-Minute Novelist, the Catherine Grubb of the 10-Minute Novelist was featured back on episode 82, the Drabble episode. One of the 10-Minute Novelists had a family tragedy this summer, and to honor her, the community is donating all of the proceeds for their merchandise through the end of July, so I guess it'll be over by the time this episode airs. Um but donating it to the family. So in the spirit of that, I picked up some extra 10-Minute Novelist sticker sheets. They are a sheet of 20-inch square stickers that say, I'm writing, and now everyone leave me the heck alone, or I will stab you with an exceedingly sharp pencil. If that is something you would like in your life, I would love to share a page with you. All you have to do really is just share this episode in your social media, whatever form that takes, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you are, and then just... Let me know that you did and what your mailing address is, and I will pop one of these sticker sheets in the mail to the first five people who do that. Just a way of sharing some writer love and some support to our friends over at the 10 Minute Novelists. One other quick announcement. I'm going to stop saying this every episode because I it's not something I really want to focus on, but... Our fundraising campaign is still live over at patreon.com. It's patreon.com slash no extra words. If this show has meant something to you, that just gives you the option to pledge a couple bucks a month towards the ongoing support of keeping us going. And we've had three different people step up with some pledges, and it's been awesome to see. And I really appreciated those folks who want to share their support in that way. And there's other ways you can support us as well, including submitting your story and sharing the show with a friend. Coming up next, Jeffrey Tony takes us into his writing space. Lisa Ko talks watermelon, which seemed like a great story to end with on this hot August night. We're cruising through the summer here on No Extra Words, and we're pleased to have you along with us. I will see you soon right here on the show. My writer's space invites me in unexpectedly, sometimes inconveniently, to sit, even stand, at my laptop, newborn thoughts bubbling up to the surface, ready to pop the top off, simmering steam hissing from the day's topped pot. My writer's space can be fickle, fetching, homebound, comforting. Grounded as freshly brewed coffee at my dining room table, scattered with hastily written notes of a story crazy to be born, or can shine light on hazy, befuddling dreams, introducing beguiling feral creatures feeding off doubt, romping towards a bright new day. 
My writer's space can be barren, wretched radio silence stuck in a long list of pro forma editor's rejections. The same thank yous. Best of luck with placing your work elsewhere. My work's little scared orphan staying up late at night. Visions of unconditional love from a future family. My writer's space builds girders open to a sunny day. A strong steel structure growing taller and fuller as words coalesce, bringing refuge to old demons, ready to battle for another day. My writer's space offers a feast for the starving, a place to empty the mind, a resort for the tired, a raucous party for the wallflower, a canvas for the clumsy artist, a battlefield open for a rap battle, no winners, no losers, just nonstop flowing, sowing seeds, bursting bright blossoms from fecund soil. If you want to learn more about my writing, you can find me on the Huffington Post, on Twitter, at Jeff Tony, sometimes on The Hill, Crack the Spine, Cichlet Magazine, and, of course, on No Extra Words. Watermelon by Lisa Ko. People called him Watermelon. They didn't name him Watermelon because of his red shirt that draped over his Buddha belly, or the fact that he made you feel like it was summer even in the most blustery days with the Beach Boys blasting through the beat up radio. Or maybe the way he said, Good evening, where to? was the nicest way any taxi cab driver could speak to his passengers. But Watermelon loved eating watermelons. When he helped an elderly lady with bags of groceries from the local market, he couldn't help but to ask, Any watermelon today? Yes, watermelon's in season again. He lit up with a big smile. He enjoyed the crisp first bite into the reddest part of the fruit's flesh. He would let the juices drip down his chin as he swallowed the sweet nectar, eager for the next taste. Eating watermelon took him back to when he sat by his porch, his wooden porch overlooked his garden of pink plumerias and birds of paradise that he tended to every morning after breakfast. Later in the day, the local community hula club would arrive with the little girls in their tiny grass skirts by his home. Melalina was the young dance instructor who taught at the hula club. He would watch her sway her tan, gleaming hips to the ukulele as the waves crashed against the white shore. The hula song that she taught told the story of a bird finding its way home from a long journey of traveling. Her voice melted with the sun, serenading to the young children as they giggled and danced along with her. Her slender arms swooped up and down as she spun, allowing her vanilla scent to linger by him. Melalina waved to him every Saturday. In these moments, he allowed himself to vanish in the eternal seconds of perhaps loving her, and she occasionally loved him back. He had never spoken to her. Watermelon was the only driver who had a hula girl propped on top of the gray dashboard shaking at every green light or sudden stop in the blanket of disillusioned chaos. He had been to every corner of the sleepless city. People who knew of Watermelon included distinguished women who wore dresses to Sunday brunches that cost more than his rent, and bachelor drunkards that howled into the two o'clock moonlight through his cab window. He is the sunniest ride, they said. His shift ended at four o'clock in the morning, and he'd head to the diner right by the subway stop and get the usual— Bacon, eggs, potatoes, and a glass of orange juice. He never knew if he liked the food or not, but it was affordable and always open. He walked by throngs of homeless men that cuddled up with the layers of newspaper before buzzing into his building. He sat outside the small balcony of his apartment and overlooked the dark towers and blanket of lights. He took a bite of the watermelon. It was not as juicy as he had anticipated, and the sweetness was faint. His flowers had wilted in the pots, lifelessly drooping by the edge. The sun was rising, but he was not asleep. He thought of home as he ate his watermelon. But where was home? He never doubted his decision to move out of the island, yet thinking of it saddened him. The island was a snow globe. If he shook the snow globe, the island would come to life again, with the vibrant hues of his garden and Melalina's sweet laughter. 
Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information about today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. If you would like to support the show, please tell a few friends about us, or you can visit patreon.com slash noextrawords to pledge your financial support. See you next time.